Well, good evening. Welcome. Welcome here to uh, Redeemer University. It's my privilege to welcome you. Uh, my name is Dr. Rob Joustra, and I'm the founding director of the Center for Christian Scholarship here at Redeemer, and also the uh, host for this evening's lecture and the host for uh, the Emerging Public Intellectual Award, which we're celebrating this evening. The Center created the Emerging Public Intellectual Award to recognize and learn from outstanding early career achievements of exceptional scholars whose work showed clear evidence of being civically minded for the common good and rooted in the person and work of Jesus Christ, deeply Christian. The award is not mine. I don't even vote. Uh, it's not even ours here at Redeemer, only ours. It is funded and adjudicated by the Center for Public Justice in Washington, by CARDIS, by the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, and the Henry Institute at Calvin College, and the Acton Institute. Today, we've been especially grateful to have the support and partnership of Resonate Ministries, and especially in the person of Greg Sinclair of the Christian Reformed Church of North America. We get outstanding applications every single year, and this is what we look for. A Christian faith that cannot fail to bubble over into all of the areas of the applicant's life and work. We do not need to hunt for it. We do not need to guess at how they might think of their faith and their scholarship. It is constantly ever present. And their scholarship itself is of such high caliber, of such significant weight, that they have begun to develop important teaching and writing deserving of a wide audience. They have not simply published a great deal, they have produced works that the committee believes are of enduring significance. And that work and that spirituality is contagious. Calvin Sierbald liked to say that you cannot teach wisdom, but it is contagious, it can be caught. Their work shows evidence of having burst the modest boundaries of academic life or even the Christian world and regularly rubs shoulders with neighbors, writers, and new friends outside of the Christian or academic world. These are the sort of people that we want to hear from, learn from, and support here at Redeemer. And so it is my special delight to introduce one of our sponsors, Dr. Jessica Joustra, Chair of the Board of the Center for Public Justice in Washington to present this year's Emerging Public Intellectual Award. Please join me in welcoming her. <laughs> Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Center for Public Justice in Washington, D.C., and on behalf of the other sponsors for this award, I am delighted to present this year's Emerging Public Intellectual Award to Dr. Matthew Kamink. Dr. Kamink is both a product of the kinds of institutions that sponsor this award, and now one who pours into the formation of young adults and many others, equipping them to take seriously the way that their faith impacts their engagement in the public square, including political life, the market, and interfaith relationships. Dr. Koenig received his BA from Whitworth University, an MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary, a PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary, and from the Free University in Amsterdam. During his PhD, he was also awarded a Fulbright Scholarship to go to Amsterdam to study political theology and European conflict over Muslim immigration. Following his studies, Dr. Kamek served as the founder and executive director of the Fuller Institute for Theology and Northwest Culture in Seattle, Washington from 2013 to 2017. From 2017 to the present, he has served as an assistant professor of Christian ethics at Fuller Seminary, an associate dean for Fuller, Texas, and a scholar in residence for the Max Dupree Center for Christian Leadership. His work on questions of cultural engagement, formation, and the impact of theology and faith in the public square has been wide. And his impact has been broad. And in this work, he displays the criteria of this award <coughs> profoundly, with a contagious commitment to the centrality of Jesus Christ in every aspect of his work, and a public-facing commitment for the common good. This evening, we will have the opportunity to hear from him on a topic of his first book, Christian Hospitality and Muslim Immigration 
in an age of fear. This book thus far has proven to be his signature academic contribution and was awarded uh, and was known to be in an award Christianity Today's, one of Christianity Today's best books of 2018. In this work, Dr. Kamek displays a remarkable ability to both diagnose some of the pressing questions of our day and respond with thoughtful and capacious Christian reform, even Kuyperian, insights into the particular challenges of our time living as Christians in North America in the 21st century. But in Dr. Kamek's work, it's more than just the topics that he addresses that sets him apart. It's also the way he inhabits and embodies the challenges that he is addressing and the insights that he's offering. Dr. Kamek does not just teach hospitality, generosity, conviction, and civility. He lives it. These gifts and his person have propelled him into the important work and dialogues that are incredibly public facing, seeking to tackle questions of the common good and pluralism in a polarized climate on polarizing issues. One of the perhaps most profound applications of his insights and his work can be seen in public dialogues with Shadi Hamid, who is a senior fellow at a large think tank in the United States, himself is a Muslim, and his work focuses on political Islam and American relations with the Islamic world. Together, they have dialogued about and advocated for a kind of pluralism that takes the full weight of our religious convictions into the public square. Hamid, in his reflections on these dialogues with Dr. Kamek, has reflected this. He said, I can't say that learning about Christian theology has made me a better Muslim, but it has, I think, made me a better American. Dr. Kamek's ability to build bridges, to mine and share insights from the Christian tradition, specifically the Kuyperian tradition of principled pluralism, and work together with thinkers who have significantly different commitments, all while maintaining and promoting distinctly Christian insights, make him a remarkable fit for this award. He has helped to bring perhaps seemingly obscure theologians, like Abraham Kuyper, beloved around these areas, to pages of popular national magazines, and shown their concrete relevance to contemporary life and the common good. Because of these gifts and many more, it is my distinct privilege to present this year's Emerging Public Intellectual Award to Dr. Koenig. Please join me in congratulating him. Give me a minute. Not. <laughs> um, well, to say this is an honor is uh, an understatement. Uh, thank you um, to the members of the committee, to these institutions, uh, to Redeemer University. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I went to Everett Christian School, my, my elementary school, when I was five years old. And that was the first Christian institution, um, after, of course, the church that baptized me. And um, to see these Christian institutions coming together to continue to support Christian education, uh, Christian scholarship, the formation of young leaders, um, it's, a, it's a special moment for me. Uh, I've, I've had Christian institutions investing in me and teachers investing in me for, for decades now. And, uh, and um, yeah, they, they, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's an honor to be here. Um, it's an honor to have an opportunity to share. Um, 
when you are a young academic and you write a book, you're, you're really hoping that your mother reads it. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's wonderful to find that um, other people have found it helpful as well. Um, we're going to be talking tonight about this issue of Muslim immigration and Christian hospitality. And um, I got engaged in this topic. A number of different aspects of my life drew me to this topic, but one was um, when I was just finishing as an undergraduate in a Christian college, I had the opportunity to work at a, um, a refugee center in Eastern Europe. This was right after the Iraq, and, um, the Iraq invasion in 2003. And um, refugees were streaming into Europe um, from Iraq, Afghanistan, and Iran. And uh, as a young college graduate, I was teaching English in a refugee camp there. And listening to the stories of these refugees, building relationships with them, eating with them, um, and hearing about all of the ways in which they had made this harrowing journey um, to Europe had a massive impact on me. And as a young political science student, um, someone who was also interested in theology, I was wrestling with what does this mean for me as an American citizen? And um, through the course of the next decade, I continued to ask these questions about Christian citizenship, uh, deep difference, and what does it mean to demonstrate uh, a Christ-like hospitality in, in and through all these spaces. And so, um, yeah, it's an honor to get to share with you tonight. So, let's get started. Um, my research is focused on this question of what is a faithful Christian response to the debate over Muslim immigration. And this comes out of a research project um, that was supported through the Fulbright uh, grant um, process, which sent me to Europe to study the debate, the growing debate over Muslim immigration there. Muslim immigration in Europe. After World War II, um, the rebuilding economies of Europe were, um, were burgeoning. Uh, factories were opening, retail, technology, gas industry was growing, and there was a need for cheap labor throughout Western Europe. In the 1950s and 1960s, a variety of different European countries opened what they called guest worker programs, in which they would invite um, Muslim workers from Turkey, Morocco, throughout Northern Africa to come to Europe to work as guest workers. And the emphasis, of course, was always on the guestness of them that they would eventually go home. And so they would set up um, large apartment complexes outside of European cities where uh, Muslims would live. They would even set up little Muslim schools and they have little um, ethnic cultural centers. Um, and the idea was that eventually they would go home. So, as then they did not. They started to have children and their families grew and they decided uh, that they wanted to stay. And they felt more connected to these European countries than they did to their home country. And their children no longer spoke their um, indigenous language. And so during the 1970s and 80s, discussions began to grow of what do we do? Um, and a, there were a variety of different programs that developed throughout Europe um, to um, help these workers eventually come into um, European life. The problem, of course, was that these new Muslim immigrants did not respond in the way that was expected. They did not assimilate into European culture, European values, European philosophy in the way that was expected. And throughout the 90s, um, a, a number of things started to happen. A sense of resentment um, on both sides uh, began to grow. And around the, age of, uh, around the year 2000, these sort of, um, these anxieties on both sides began to explode and become um, very public debates. And so my research is a reflection upon these debates and upon um, this European experience. And what I'm doing is asking the question of what can we learn in North America from this experience? And what resources do we have as Christians for navigating these debates as they increasingly uh, become important in Canada and the United States? Though being an American, I'm going um, to hold back from commenting on Canada. That seems wise. <laughs> <clears throat> 
And while my, while my discussion and my theological ethics that I'll be discussing tonight has to do with Muslim immigration and how we interact with our Muslim neighbors, this really is a discussion about difference and how we as Christians encounter difference. And in a globalizing world, I like to say that our, our encounter with difference is deep, it's close, and it's fast. So difference is deep, it's close, and it's fast. It's deep in that the differences between us are, are profound. It's fast in that we are moving quickly. The differences are, are coming at us quickly, and we have very little time to react to them. Um, and it's close in that we are living increasingly on top of one another. And so what Christian discipleship means, what Christian hospitality means, is that it's going to need to navigate differences that are coming quickly, that are deep, and that are fast. And that presents a very profound problem for the Christian ethicist. How can I become the kind of citizen who can be hospitable, not simply when it's nice and easy, not simply when they speak my language, they share my race and my religion, but when that difference is, is, is profound, when it's coming at me quickly. How can I demonstrate a hospitality that is sustainable amidst that kind of difference, that kind of globalization of difference? And as a Christian ethicist, that is a question that fascinates me. How can we cultivate Christian citizens that can handle that? So in Europe, broadly speaking, there are two major reactions that have been happening over the past uh, 30 years to this. Um, and those reactions can simply be put as high walls and open doors. Um, two different forms of language, two different forms of responding to this issue of Muslim um, immigration. High walls, we have the language of restriction, the language of security. Muslim immigrants are profoundly, are, are framed as a security issue. Um, they need to be restrained and restricted. Uh, a sense of uh, a need to uh, emphasize national culture, to regain what does it mean to be German, what does it mean to be French, what does it mean to be British, and a need for them to assimilate into this Britishness or this Frenchness or this Swissness. So discussions that many European countries haven't had for decades they are bringing up again of, we need to discuss what is our national identity. Um, I can imagine that this discussion may be going on in Canada a bit. What does it mean to be Canadian? What are we asking people to integrate into exactly? <clears throat> and, this, and the solution here is one of hard assimilation. Um, how do we, the question here is, how do we force Muslims to assimilate through forms of restriction and force? On the open door side, there is a posture of paternalism, a posture of we must care for these people. We must, um, we must provide them with government aid in the forms of um, welfare, uh, health care, education, um, job training, um, and a, a multicultural policy that would fund uh, cultural centers. And the hope being here, not that they would be independent cultures, but if we I'll give you an example. Um, with Turkish immigrants in the Netherlands, uh, certain um, centers for Turkish culture and centers for Tur Turkish education were set up under the guise of multiculturalism, uh, a sort of, we appreciate Turkish culture. But there were several government um, documents that clearly showed that why they were funding these Turkish cultural centers was the hope that eventually there, by empowering their culture, they would finally be empowered to assimilate into Dutch culture. So it wasn't a true multiculturalism in the sense of we want Turkish culture to flourish in the Netherlands, but we would like to use a Turkish school in order to get you to ultimately assimilate to Dutchness. And so it's more of a soft form of assimilation. So on both, the debate is really one of uh, method of assimilation in Europe. Do you assimilate through the carrot or the stick, if you will? Um, but the Muslim immigrant is always seen as the problem to be solved, the question to be answered. 
And the state is, is the machinery by which the Muslim is assimilated into European culture. So many, it's very common to have debates and discussions of um, how might we see a, um, a Muslim renaissance, a Muslim reformation, a Muslim enlightenment. And the, the assumption is always they must walk our historical path so that eventually they can become like us. So the debate is really one of method towards the common goal. Okay. This is entirely unnuanced, so you can read the book for a more nuanced. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. um, so, yeah, oh, this is a, a photo of Muslims praying during a protest. This is in front of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. So Muslims are continually framed as a question to be answered, an issue to be solved, a problem to be solved. So then we come to the question of how are Christians in Europe responding to this? And by and large, uh, they are largely signing up for either the language of high walls or open doors. Um, they are largely following the secular rhetoric that is given to them. Um, Christianity is not providing a, a profound alternative way. Um, and I'm, I can report from the United States that uh, it's quite similar there. Um, the language of high walls or open doors is really being largely accepted by Christians there. Uh, Christ does not really play a, a central role in the political imagination of Christian citizens uh, in America on this question of immigration. So how do Christians regularly respond to difference? Well, historically speaking, there's a number of sort of common ways in which Christians have responded to difference. Um, the first one is you encounter religious difference and you dominate it. You use political power to dominate that religious difference and um, get rid of it. The second sort of classic Christian response is assimilation. You use the machinery of the state to assimilate that difference into your own. The third Christian response is one of retreat. You encounter religious difference that is disruptive for you and you run away. You run to rural areas, you set up your own communities, um, but you essentially give up. Um, that is that sort of third classic uh, Christian response to difference. Fourth is you, you deny the difference. You say, well, there, there isn't really a meaningful difference between, sort of in our case would be between Christianity and Islam. They're basically the same religion. There's really no important differences. Um, and you simply try to deny that the difference exists. And that solves it quickly for you. Fourth classic uh, Christian, uh, Christian response. I have assimilate here twice, and it's not a mistake. Here, the Christians assimilate themselves into the difference. So here, in this first one, you're asking the difference to assimilate into you. Here, you solve the problem by joining. If you can't beat them, join them. And I can tell you that Christians in America, I can find you examples of each of these, um, of what they would like. And then the last is a sort of laissez-faire posture towards difference, a sort of um, I don't care. You do what you do, I do what I do, and a sort of a shrugging of the shoulders, um, a disinterest in the religious difference of your neighbor. And what I developed in my book is um, this uh, age-old concept of principled pluralism, which rejects each of these, and it has a bit of a test. I'd like to say, a test, and each of these options fail that principled pluralism test. And the basic test involves two rules. The first rule is you must hold true to your own principles, so you can't, you can't give in on your specific principles. And then the second is that you must make gracious space for other principles, for other people's principles. So each of these fail, that, fail one aspect of these tests. You must hold true to your principles and you must make space, make gracious space for others. I want to sort of develop this theological case
for this form of theological pluralism. Abraham Kuyper. This is, look at this pipe. <laughs> it's just tremendous. So what Kuyper provides us, Kuyper is a, a theologian in the Netherlands, also a politician and political activist who wrestled with these questions of deep, deep difference. And um, he was um, specifically in power during this very unique political moment in the Netherlands in which the Netherlands was split between four different ideologies. And none of them were powerful enough to dominate the country. So you had um, socialism, liberalism, Catholicism, and Protestantism. And at that time, uh, at the turn of the century, um, they were relatively equal in their political power, so much as they could not dominate on, them, on their own. And wrestling with these questions of pluralism, he develops his own uh, Christological form of pluralism. Um, I'm cheering for you. <laughs> so what he does is develop a Christian understanding of how we as Christians can live in this divided society, deep division of these four spaces. And he provides two different cases that I explore. One is his case against ideological uniformity why we as Christians and why we as citizens should never be for an ideologically uniform nation state. So against uniformity, and then a theological case for plurality. And I want to briefly explore those two aspects. The reason specifically, and here he's, he's arguing against uh, a development of liberal uniformity that was very popular at the time that wanted to make the Dutch nation state modern liberalism and wanted to privatize other religions and ideologies. So they wanted the Catholics and the Protestants and the socialists to be privatized and be small and be quiet essentially under a sort of liberal domination. What he argued was that those who argue for ideological uniformity fundamentally misunderstand faith and how faith works. Because he said that faith is pluriform, it's pervasive, and it's public. And because faith is, are the, is these three things, um, ideological uniformity can never hold within a, within a state. So let me talk about these three points and, and walk us through this. First of all, Kuiper would argue that faith is pluriform. It's diverse. Because of sin, our faiths will never agree. They will never be brought together in this age. And any effort to do so will involve a great deal of bloodshed. And no one has the authority to bring these faiths together. So the pluriformity, the diversity, the division between faiths. Kuiper would use the language of antithesis, this, this deep division between faiths. Second, pervasive. There's no way to get away from faith. All of us have faith. And so he was constantly arguing that the liberals themselves were people of faith. Uh, and this greatly frustrated the liberals. Um, and he constantly and he enjoyed exposing their dogmas, exposing their belief system, and saying, you have a faith just like I do. And all of us bring our faith to this public square. And we're not going to agree. And we cannot form a government system whereby we all assimilate into one faith system. And then finally, public. Faith is public. Faith is always going to be coming into the public square. It's always going to be seeping into our political discussions. And so any demand that I privatize my faith um, is not going to work. So if these three things are true, if faith is always going to be public, if we all have it and we can't get away from it, 
and we're always going to be divided, then cases for ideological uniformity, cases for ideological assimilation, assimilating children into one national faith, is not only unjust, it's deeply destabilizing to the state. It's unsafe. And it won't last because faith is always going to be bubbling up and you're not going to be able to stop it. So he makes this first, this case against ideological uniformity. So as we think about Islam, the implications are clear. You cannot assimilate and snuff out Islam through a uh, government manufactured assimilation machine. And the history of Europe over the last four decades bears this out. The Germans, the French, the British, the Dutch have all tried small government programs, a variety of them, to try and assimilate um, Muslims into liberal modernity. And I, can t I could stay here all night talking about all the unique backlashes in these different countries that have happened through these assimilation efforts. But Kuiper does not simply attack these efforts for uniformity and assimilation. He provides a positive uh, account of plurality, of why Christians should be in favor of deep religious and ideological freedom, of making space for different ideological communities to exist within a single state. And he rests this very specifically on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Christological sovereignty. That Christ is king. And if Christ is king, then that means Christians are not. It's about as simply as I can put it. If Christ is king, then Christians are not. And so if Christians try to grasp the state, if Christians try to use political power to assimilate difference into them, then he says what, what you are doing is you are taking Christ's crown and you're putting it on your head. You're taking Christ's throne and you are sitting in it. So making space for religious difference, for ideological difference, is a way of honoring Christ's crown and Christ's throne. And taking that crown for yourself is a way of dishonoring Christ's crown. So it's not simply an act of charity for Kuiper. It's not, let's be nice Christians and make space for these other people. Out of our own beneficence, out of our own benevolence, we will make space for you um, your quaint little culture and your quaint little religion. It is not a benevolent act in Kuiper's mind. It is a, a divine command, and to not do this is an act of blasphemy. It is saying, Christ is weak, and I need to take the control for my own. Okay? So he roots it in Christ's crown. Rob, could you? Could you give me like a five minute warning when I'm getting close? I would appreciate that. <clears throat> so what we're searching here for is a Christ-centered pluralism. Not a form of pluralism that borrows from the world, from the, pol the secular politics of the high walls or the secular politics of the open doors, but a Christ-centered pluralism. One that begins and ends with Christ. What we don't want to do is, is borrow the language of nationalism and Islamophobia and sprinkle Bible verses on top of it, or borrow the language of tolerance and multiculturalism and sprinkle Bible verses on top of that. But we want to begin with Christ and have it shot through with Christ and have it end with Christ. And Kuiper provides a wonderful start to that. The crown, as I have said, demands public justice. Kuiper provides a wonderful start to that. But what I argue in the book, and I want to argue tonight, is that public justice is not enough for this cultural moment. 
that it is not enough simply to provide freedom to our Muslim neighbors and to provide justice to them. We actually have to be friends with them. We actually have to build relationships with them. Christ demands more of us than simply being just to them. And frankly, there is more to Christ than the crown. So I want to shift here and argue that the cross demands a public hospitality. So the crown of Christ demands a public justice, and the cross of Christ demands a public hospitality. In the cross, we see the core of God's identity, of his nature, of his mission, of his work, of his end. In the cross, we see God himself opening his arms to a world that has rejected him. That in God's nature, right there in the cross, is a God of hospitality. Throughout Holy Week, Jesus is continually making space for others. And at the end of Holy Week, we see him sitting down to a meal with his disciples. And after the resurrection, once again, we see him sitting down for breakfast with his disciples. The ultimate end of that cross is relationship. The end of the cross is not justice. The final purpose of the cross is relationship. Justice is done there on that cross, but that's not the ultimate end of that cross. It's relationship. The ultimate end, the ultimate nature of Christ is that love and that reconciliation. And what is... Um, what is in danger sometimes in reformed political theology, I would argue, is that we can privatize the cross. We can say that the cross is a personal and private moment by which individuals are saved and not recognize that the hospitality that we receive um, has public implications for us. That if God has shown us hospitality when we were far off, that has public implications for our lives. That we actually have to show that hospitality to others. That we have been purchased into a mission of hospitality, into a way of hospitality, so that um, as we go and serve in hospitals and businesses, as we go and serve in City Hall and in schools, as we encounter deep difference, we are to be people not simply of public justice but also of public hospitality. That that cross has implications for our public lives and not simply our private lives. And as we think about the conflict over Muslim immigration, we see that this debate is extremely complex and it impacts every area of our life. We work alongside Muslims. We study alongside them. We live alongside them. We vote alongside them. Some of them marry our children. And so the calling to public hospitality is not simply for a few Christian politicians in our capitals, but it's a calling for all of us in our daily lives, in our daily work. So beyond walls and doors, I want to come back to this metaphor of the house. So as we think about, this is just another way of thinking about the purpose of, <clears throat> um, the purpose of hospitality and why, why this is so important. So as you think about the rhetoric of high walls and open doors, remember what we talked about in the beginning. The rhetoric of high walls is all about security, right? Keeping difference out. Keeping difference out. The rhetoric of open doors is a sense of openness, of, of embrace, of come in. But neither of these, the rhetoric of high walls or the rhetoric of open doors, provide us with a sense of how we actually live together once we're inside the house. And um, uh, the rhetoric of high walls can't help me think about how I live with this deep difference once it's inside. It can only lament that it's there, right? 
the open doors can welcome in, but it can't provide me with a language and a character to sit with that deep difference. The struggle on the open doors side is that there, there can be a romantic nature to how it thinks about difference and multiculturalism and diversity. That let's welcome in this difference and we will celebrate it and it will be wonderful and it will be great and there won't be any problems. And um, it does not truly reckon with the cost of diversity, the, the discomfort, the difficulty. It doesn't wrestle with the question of how do we deal with difference that is deep and fast and close. It's then, instead, it, it wipes sort of a thin veneer of positivity over diversity, a sort of thin tolerance. And so what we need, what we need is a table politics. Because the ultimate aim of a house is to be able to sit down at a table. And the language of high walls and open doors can't help us sit down at a table and can't help us stay there. And what we find in the purpose of Christ, and this is what I argue, what we find in the person of Christ is someone who can sit at a table with deep difference, with deep pain, with deep violence, with deep injustice, whether it be racial or religious or gender, whatever that might be, Christ can sit there. And it's through the power of Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can stay at the table with deep difference. And in this age of the globalization of difference, every religion, every political ideology is asking itself, how are we going to stay at this table? How are we going to hold ourselves together? And each faith and each ideology is wrestling with what resources do we have? And we as Christians have in the person and work and teachings of Jesus Christ a way to sit at that table, a way that takes the difficulty of difference seriously. The hospitality that we see in the cross is not romantic and rose-colored. It's bloody, right? Hospitality of the cross is costly, right? Jesus doesn't promise us that it would be easy. He doesn't promise kumbaya. Right? It's not a thin multiculturalism that is romantic about these things. It's costly. But he promises to be with us. He gives us those resources to sit at that table. That's what we find there. So when I speak on these issues, and I speak at a, a variety of different Christian colleges about Muslim immigration, and I encounter lots of questions after I give these um, talks. And as I said at the beginning, this is often framed as the challenge of Muslim immigration or the problem of Muslim immigration or the, the crisis, the question. And I'm continually, continually trying to reframe this as a profound opportunity for the Church of Jesus Christ in the West. A profound opportunity. And I want to tell you just a couple of little stories and anecdotes as to why I think this is the case. The first one is that if you look at churches that are flourishing in Europe right now, today, the churches that are flourishing, there are two kinds that are specifically flourishing, and both of them have to do with immigration. The first form of churches that are flourishing in Europe are African immigrant churches blowing up all over Europe. Then the second, are, and I have seen this in multiple different cities, white churches in Europe that are opening themselves and connecting with immigrants. Immigration is one of the best things happening for the European church. And what I say here is that what immigration offers the church is an opportunity to meet Christ and to practice Christ's hospitality again a hospitality that the church has lost, a practice that the church has forgotten. It's an opportunity to learn that again. And as I spoke with Christians in the Netherlands, I found this again and again and again. Christians telling me about a tired faith that they had for decades and telling me about how they started to welcome immigrants into their home and hear their stories and interact with them and in 
and go visit them in asylum centers and the ways in which Jesus met them there and moved them there is profound. This is a picture of a church in England that was getting ready for Christmas. And um, this was a, a dying congregation and they wanted to find some way to um, make the Christmas story come alive. And they interacted with an artist, like you should. And they said, they asked this artist to help them think about this. <clears throat> and this was during the height of the Syrian refugee crisis. And what the artist did was uh, take clothing that had been left on the shore uh, in Greece. You saw that photo at the opening of the lecture of um, the Syrian refugees coming into Greece. This artist took clothing from the beaches, and you'll see their children's clothing and life preservers and whatnot. And the artist suspended the clothes above the congregation. And there they celebrated the Christmas story and remembered the child Christ who had to run to Egypt right, to escape the brutality of Herod. And they had to ponder the meaning of Christmas for themselves and for their world and what the Christian message had to say to them. And I can just imagine for myself what it must have been like to be there and to be asked to sing a song like, they will know we are Christians by our love with those clothes hanging above my head. What Muslim immigration represents, friends, is of course a challenge, of course an issue, but profoundly a Christian public imagination must frame this as an opportunity to rediscover and hear Christ's call for us today to be people of hospitality, of grace, salt, and light. Thank you. We're going to do questions now. So That's great. I was yeah. going to say you beat yeah. me to it. We do have uh, we have a little bit of time here left over. Oh, good. This can catch me uh, for some Q and A. Uh, and uh, I'm sure, like me, you also have some questions after this. Uh, so we have. I think we have a lot of the time. Let's see. Two. Oh, wow, there's a lot happening here. Customer uh, and uh, Reverend Hoganter, very good. But you know, with two people in the house, Islam divides the world into the house of Islam and the house of war. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So Islam, uh, you said Islam divides the world into the house of Islam and the house of war. Yes. And can I speak to that? Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so Islam being a global religion like Christianity, is a very diverse thing. And so anytime we speak about what Islam is, uh, we get ourselves into trouble. Um, just like anytime we talk about what Christianity is, uh, we get ourselves into trouble. So um, what I would just say is um, there are some Muslims for whom that is the kind of posture they want to take, that if they are not with their own kind, they are at war. Um, and that is absolutely true. And it's extremely important that we recognize and say that out loud. As opposed to um, making large, facile statements about Islam being peace. Islam is not peace. But neither is Christianity. Uh, and so it's not helpful to romantically describe whole religions uh, as, as peace. But it's also not helpful to describe them as wholly violent. So as a Christian, um, I believe human beings are made in the image of God, and so they are profoundly shot through with a sense of uh, morality. And so I have not been surprised at all to find Muslims who are incredibly gracious, incredibly truthful, incredibly courageous, um, who overwhelm me with their love and their grace and their humility and who embarrass me by their overwhelming virtue 
towards me in ways that I'm not capable of myself. So, yes, sir. Yeah, there are some um, difficult and dangerous Muslims out there and some difficult and dangerous Muslim theology. That's absolutely true. Um, but I'm grateful that the religion is much more complex than that as well. Yes, sir. And I also very much appreciate your speech. I've had some limited uh, contact with Muslims here, uh, as well as also in Bangladesh for a time. And I have found, as you just mentioned, many of them to be very good, honorable people, good colleagues, good team members, uh, and, and a pleasure to work with. But again, you know, I think of that dichotomy that they exist in, on the one hand, they want to be good and to be well respected and to be thought of with respect. But there is the direction of the Quran, Christians and Muslims. And that sort of came to light also uh, my colleague, former colleague here in Hamilton, Muslim, his name happened to be Mohammed, and he emigrated from Egypt because he did not want his family to grow up in a Muslim culture. I think that's quite telling. Yeah, so I'd appreciate some comment on that dichotomy that, in which they seem to exist. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> so the comment on the, they want to raise their children in the West um, as opposed to their, yeah. I think that, um, I'll say a number of things. Number one, um, the victims of terrorism, Islamic terrorism, are by and large, by far, Muslims. Muslims are the victims of terrorism much more than Christians. And there are many Muslims um, who say that they would much rather live in, in, just as you said, Canada or the United States. My friend Shadi Hamid would say that the United States is the best place to be a Muslim in the world. Um, and um, so, yes, that's, that's, um, that's very true. A lot, of those, a lot of those regions are extremely difficult. Yeah. Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, just for in kind of Canadian context, we have in Canada many rural churches that aren't necessarily involved in this conversation at all, right? Um, can you offer just a practical starting point for a church, be it rural or in, in a city, for, to maybe educate themselves a little bit to kind of come into this conversation around hospitality? To, uh, Yep. It's a great question. So as far as rural congregations, what kind of advice would you give? Um, um, does your community have a mosque within it? Um, or, no. no, okay. Well, for starters, there's a great little film called Jesus in Athens. It's a nice little, have you heard of it? Okay, so it's... um. It's a story, it's, a, it's sort of a documentary talking about the revival of the church in Greece over the last three years since the Syrian refugee crisis. And it tells the story of many um, refugees who have come through and it follows them on their path from Syria into Europe. And then it, it follows a number of pastors and Christian communities in uh, Greece who have experienced profound renewal and revival through this. And so that would be a really fascinating film for your church to watch and then just discuss um, because you get to see and feel it right there. Um, of course, it would be wonderful for you to actually have a mosque that you can interact with, but um, that's a, it's a lovely story. Um, in terms of churches, I want to tell a brief story of a church planter in Amsterdam um, that I met. <clears throat> he... Uh, he desired to plant a church. He was a, a white Dutchman who wanted to plant a church in a largely Muslim neighborhood in West Amsterdam. And his big idea, he was a young, idealistic church planter. You know the type, right? Um, and he was going to charge in there, and he was going to plant this church. And um, his idea was, I'm going to make meals for them, and they're going to come to me 
and um, I'm going to build this church by making meals for them, and I'm going to be super hospitable and great, and they're just going to think I'm amazing. And um, no one comes to his meals. I don't know if it's Dutch cooking, but, <laughs> but no one's coming to his meals, and this young, this young church planter is becoming uh, frustrated and sad, and um, he's really struggling to build relationships in the neighborhood. And one evening, he's walking down the hallway of his apartment complex, and he smells some really good food. And it's um, his Ethiopian neighbor, and she's cooking. And he's feeling down, and she invites him in. He has a meal with her. It's an incredible traditional Ethiopian meal. She, she shares the story of her mother back in Ethiopia who taught her this, this meal, this dish, and her grandmother. And he learns more about her story. And he just asks her questions. And his whole understanding of ministry flipped upside down that night. And he began to become a guest. And he began to ask questions rather than provide answers. And he began to eat their food and hear their stories. And what he did was actually um, begin to invite them to cook for him and their neighbors. So you have neighbors from Ethiopia and Somalia and Turkey and Morocco and Suriname and Indonesia, and they take turns making meals for one another. And the one who makes the meals shares the story of their own culture and their own dish and their favorite mealtime. And you see, these immigrants in the Netherlands are always treated as the problem to be solved. They're always treated as the patient. You know, the social worker comes to teach them how to be truly Dutch. They are the vacuum that must be filled. They have nothing to offer the Netherlands, right? But he flips that around. And so a new church was developed out of this eating and storytelling and sharing. And he provided nothing but listening and a, you know, a hungry stomach. And so, honestly, a really critical part of Christian hospitality is learning to be a guest, learning to put yourself in the vulnerable position, because the host is the one who's in charge. The host is the one who sets the agenda. And when you learn to become a guest, when you learn to ask questions, when you learn to enter the mosque and ask them to tell their stories is when these things can start to flip. Yes, uh, I've been watching this for quite a few years, and yeah, it's just an old man standing back here, you guys. <laughs> that beard is, I, I, I'm jealous. It's, <laughs> that beard is, I'm jealous. Well, someday, someday. <laughs> you're <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, man. Okay. Does it work now? I'm yeah, it works, to man. It, man. <laughs> right. um, oh. So we got all these... Um, Arabs, Muslims coming in to our country, and you start thinking, God, what is your plan? How does this all work out in your plan? Yeah. And you think about it and you say, well, we're having a great difficulty um, going out to Muslim countries and converting them. Well, what happens? They kill our missionaries, they send them out, and it makes it very difficult. God had a plan. And he said, guess what? I'll bring them to you. And I think we can all take a look at that and say, the Muslims are here, not because they wanted to be, but because they were sent here. And it's time for us to evangelize them. Let them know where the truth is. Let them know how to get to the real heaven. Thank you. Um, um, I'm not sure there was a question in there, but I'll answer it anyways. <laughs> um, so I'm a Christian ethicist. I am not a, a missions or evangelism expert. Um, but I did speak at a, a missions conference this past year. And um, I'll say this, that if we want to, to share and speak about a hospitality that God has shown to us, 
we want to tell the story of how God showed hospitality to us uh, and have that be effective, um, then living and demonstrating that hospitality to others is going to be really important. Just wondering if, if there's <coughs> value in, in comparing and contrasting a similar experience when, say, the Irish Catholics moved to New York City and were there similar, like, can we learn from history? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Wonderful question. Is, is there value in comparing this to, say, Irish Catholics? Uh, yes, I believe there absolutely is. So, um, <clears throat> Um, in the Netherlands and in New York as well, um, there was a lot of suspicion against Catholics. And the language commonality is quite common. It is quite striking. So, um, so uh, things that were said, here are a list of things that were said about uh, Catholic immigrants. Um, they have tons of babies. They're going to they're gonna outbirth us. They are loyal to a foreign power. They're loyal to Rome, right? They're not truly American. Or they're not truly Dutch. They're, they're loyal to the Pope. Um, they're not truly democratic. So if we look at Catholic countries, right, they were having lots of revolutions and things like that. They weren't stable democracies. If you let Catholics in, our American democracy will become unstable. Um, they speak a, a strange language in their worship. They don't speak English. It's Latin, you know. Um, in the Netherlands, they didn't want Catholics there because they would have these, these big public processions, you know, Catholic parades through the streets. And there are, there are common complaints in the Netherlands today about the noise from minarets and calls to prayer. Um, so there's, there's lots of parallels there. Um, what I would say is the added on is the deep uh, ethnic difference and the deep um, religious difference heightens the intensity of it um, to an even greater degree. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of similarity there. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? Yes. So you mentioned in like, the title of your presentation, you know, in, in an age of fear. And it seems like fear, and, like this came up a couple times with different questions and comments. You know, in order to be to give up our control as a host, that kind of requires overcoming fear. And especially in North America, evangelical Christians really are grappling with the sense of fear, this loss of control, this loss of power. How do we overcome that sense of fear in order to extend from hospitality who are very different from us in ways that can be very scary? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful question. So the question is how do we how do we overcome our fear so that we can show that hospitality? Um, so one chapter in the book is focused actually on uh, worship and spiritual disciplines. And so the way in which Christians historically have formed and shaped their character uh, is through practices, through regular memory, reminding themselves of who is in control. So a way to battle fear is to remind yourself of certain things. And Sunday morning worship can be a profoundly important way in which we remind ourselves of that. That fear really is out of bounds for people who believe in Easter. It's outside. Um, if you're reminding yourself of Easter every Sunday, you can't be a person of fear and also believe in the resurrection. You can't be driven by the politics of fear and believe in this, you know, in a, in a new life. And so one of the things that worship can and should and must do for us is pound that into us. Um, that we can't be people of fear, that we practice that reconciliation and restoration. Um, so um, I'll, I'll say, I say it this way in the, uh, in the book. Um, so after 9-11, after 9-11, there were all of these worship services and people who were wrapped up in fear. And churches throughout the United States responded in a variety of ways. Some of them saying, God bless America, like full-throated. Some of them were, you know, full of lament. Um, uh, but there was, there was a wide variety of ways in which worship services responded to that event. 
and it had an impact on how Christians ultimately responded. Worship matters in those things. But really, um, worship forms us over a long time. And I've been greatly impacted by the work of James K.A. Smith and others who have talked about this in, you know, in great detail about how worship works on us. Um, but this essentially means that worship directors and pastors have an important role to play in forming citizens. And it's not it's not in the direct way. Worship doesn't work directly on us. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm very rarely moved by a pastor who tells me what to think about any one political or public issue in a direct way. But it's more a way of forming our imaginations and our character in such a way that we remember who is in control and that we actually confess our fear as, as sin, as, as a lack of of faith and we ask for hope, we ask for strength, we ask for courage and we participate in that on a weekly basis is, is really important. So the Sunday morning is where the priesthood of all believers is, is shaped and formed for their lives in the world and if we are driven by the politics of fear out in the world that just means we're being formed by something else. So in the United States that just means that you know a lot of us are being formed by uh, the liturgy of Fox News and talk radio and um, other medias and liturgies of fear. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. And then, and then you. Oh, and then you. Okay. Maybe you can help me with this. I struggle with who am I dealing with when I'm facing Muslim? I've read the Quran three times, two times in Indonesia because I worked for 20 years in it. In Asia, which is with a large Muslim country, and uh, I can't get away from the fact when I read through the Quran that the bottom line is, if you don't submit to Allah, you're an infidel, you can be wiped off the face of the earth, and that seems to be a thread that keeps coming back again and again, in one form or another. Um, now I agree with you. I've met many Muslims, very friendly, very kind, wonderful people, and yet my sense is, even when working coming into Canada, to need to divide this that group into two. There are those who, who are very friendly, they're all, all of them, but because these two groups both are very friendly and kind and gentle and so forth. And yet when a push comes to shove, they will shoot you in the back because the Quran is still the basis. The other, the other group, they don't. And they seem to have a, a, a different code, an unwritten code that they don't follow the Quran. Are we, are we, is it, my sense is that are we dealing with a group of Muslims that are post-Islam, or post-Muslim, whatever you want to call it, that live by a different code than the Quran, they're not living by the Quran anymore, are they developing a new Quran? Maybe you can help me with that. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I just think you need more than two categories of Muslims. I just don't think that's enough. I think you need a lot more categories uh, of Muslims. And um, what's, what's most dangerous is when we speak about them in the abstract uh, instead of, you know, your friend, Shadi, or Muhammad, or Ahmed that you know and you eat with um, and you listen to. Um, but if what you know of Islam is, is reading their text or, or on the news, um, it's, it's very easy to put them in one big group or in two groups. Um, the more that you uh, get to know them, they become more complex. And so I think I would just encourage you to just continue to uh, get to know them and ask them questions and say, am I hearing you correctly? Um, am I reading your text correctly? Um, because I'm sure that if they were to read the Bible, you would want them to read it carefully. And you would want them to wrestle with it. And you would be honored if they asked you questions about it to make sure that they were reading it right. So perhaps you could take that Quran to your Muslim neighbor and say, this is what I think I see. Am, am, am I reading this correctly? So you put yourself in the posture as a guest in their text, and you check your notes. And you see if you need more than two categories of Muslims. Um, yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, seeing Christ in the other, seeing Christ in the Muslim Christ. Yeah. I was wondering if you could speak more about that, and maybe give a story or two about when you had Christ. Yeah, so the thing is, Yes, I'll repeat this. So he said, I, I've talked about 
seeing Christ or experiencing Christ in, in my encounters with uh, Muslims. So that's, you know, Matthew, Matthew 25, right? In the stranger, you served me, you fed me. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell one story. Um, my friend Shadi Hamid, who we've, we've mentioned a couple of times, um, um, he's a Muslim uh, political theorist with the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. He writes a regular column for The Atlantic. He's a very good writer. Um, Shadi um, uh, was wrestling with this topic of grace because I had talked about grace in one of our dialogues. We had done this dialogue on stage, and I had used this word grace, and he was trying to figure it out. And someone, I don't know who, told him that he should read the book of Galatians. And he did. He read the book of Galatians. And the next time we got together, Shadi and I were at Calvin College, and we did a dialogue. And we went out afterwards, and he said, I want to talk to you about Galatians. <laughs> I said, we can do that. And so we spent a lot of time wrestling with what is grace and what is mercy and how can God be gracious? And if God is gracious, does that just mean you get to do anything? And how can I explain why God would forgive? And he's sitting there wrestling with this question. He's looking at me. And there in that moment, I get this opportunity to take this term that for so many Christians, grace, we say it all the time in such a cheap, easy way. And we so often fail to wrestle with the scandal, the insanity of grace, the illogical, overwhelming, overflowingness of grace that fundamentally does not make sense. I have a PhD in theology, and I still don't fully understand grace. And there in that moment with Shadi, you're asking me, how do I experience Christ in these moments? Christ shows up and knocks me off balance in what I would describe as the most important and spiritual experience for me of that whole year was sitting down with Shadi and talking about Galatians and grace and him asking me questions. And so I encounter Christians often who think, well, if I talk to Muslims, won't my faith be in danger of being sullied? Or may I lose my faith or something like that? And once again, oh, friends, this is an opportunity. You're on, the, you're on the edge of what God is doing in the world. And you get reminded of, of the power of very simple words that you forget their, you forget their, their edge. And so it's a, it's a profound opportunity. And right next to you. Uh, can you speak to that fear that some people may have of losing their faith in the face of God? Yeah, so the fear of losing their faith. To speak on, I find that it's important to speak to yeah. the, the issue of that yeah. fear in order to get, like, it's a wall that you need to get behind before yeah. you can open it. Yeah, so, so the question is, can you speak to the fear that people have of losing their faith by engaging in discussion with Muslims? I would just say that... Um, <clears throat> Fear um, tends to tell us a lot more about who we are than what we are afraid of. So the fear that it, if you are really afraid of Muslims and you talk to me for an hour about how afraid you are of Muslims, um, I probably won't learn a lot about Muslims during that conversation, but I will learn a lot about you. Um, I'll learn something probably about the, the brittleness of your faith. The, the, the fear often exposes a weakness. And so sometimes for fe people, frankly, they are already aware they have a real problem with their faith. And they are worried that when they engage in a dialogue, that, that weakness is going to be exposed. So so it's, it's just kind of going to be shown. Because if they're confident in the resurrection, if they're confident that Christ is king and that the spirit is moving. Here's another example. Um, very old, uh, staunch Dutch Christian woman that I met in um, the city of Amersfoort 
in the Netherlands. And she had opened up her home to Muslims and um, had um, had them over for coffee and cake, like Dutch people do, I suppose. <laughs> coffee and cake regularly on Sundays, and they'd play games and they'd talk. Uh, asylum seekers and refugees who were in an asylum center just outside of the town. She looks at me, and, and I'm asking her, you know, why are you, you know, doing this? Why are you showing hospitality to Muslims? And we have a great conversation. And at one point, she gets really serious with me, and she leans forward, and she says, you know, some of these Christians. They're all afraid that the Muslims are coming here. And I say, it's the Muslims who should be afraid. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> she has a twinkle in her eye. And she says, the Muslims should be afraid to come to the Netherlands because they will meet Christians of such love and care and compassion that they will be tempted to convert to Jesus. She says, fear has no place with us. It's like, right. <laughs> so, her name is Rita Hunnink. <laughs> if you're out there, Rita. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, you and that guy. Talking about abstraction, or talking abstractly to some extent, I'm wondering if you could give us a little more depth in the concept of hospitality. I mean, use the analogy of a table and eating together. I mean, to some extent, we're, we're in a Christian institution here, which isn't, to some extent, hospitable by, by its very nature. We're, uh, many of us are members of churches which are, by nature, not hospitable to another ideology. We send our kids to Christian schools, which are not hospitable. So, I mean, is there a contradiction in being Christian and living a Christian life, which, which is busy, like, part of it is even just time, right? You're busy with church, you're busy with school, you're busy with everything. How do you find time for hospitality? Uh, I don't know if you can give us some... some so obviously, you have to find a neutral meeting place to be hospitable. And that could be your home, I guess. It could be someplace else. But yeah, yeah what, what does hospitality really mean in a, in a, in a practical way, other than eating together? That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, um, there's, there was a lot in that question. I'm trying to pick. I think what I would say is um, hospitality doesn't happen on the margins of our lives. It happens within our life. So um, um, we encounter difference in, in the workplace, in our families. Um, and um, difference may look different for you. Maybe you don't have any Muslims in your workplace or in your neighborhood. Um, maybe it's someone of a different race or a different political party or a different sexual orientation, or a different um, uh, class status. Um, but you encounter deep difference. And that difference isn't going away anytime soon. And um, so maybe it's a coworker, And it's not an extra thing. It's just demonstrating that Christian hospitality in that moment, in that place. Um, and in terms of describing your Christian churches and Christian schools is inhospitable. I think I know what you mean in that your Redeemer isn't all of a sudden going to start a, a, you know, a Muslim theology program and a Buddhist theology program. Is, Redeemer is not, as far as I know, going to start training imams. Is that right, President? No. Okay. So, <laughs> um, but actually what I would argue is that Christian schools can actually be rightly understood more hospitable to Muslims than secular modern liberal schools. And, the, um, and there are schools in the Netherlands, um, when given a choice, Muslims will often send their children to Christian schools as opposed to the secular schools in the Netherlands because they find that their beliefs are more honored there. So um, being hospitable does not mean I have no belief system. I, I'm, in, I'm inviting you into my, into my home, right? Um, it, it doesn't mean a, a relativism. And in fact, what we've seen in Europe is that deep relativism uh, does not lead to hospitality. It actually can shift to fascism quite quickly. Um, that actually knowing who you are and what you believe can, 
help you be hospitable. So um, if I got rid of my belief in Christ tomorrow, for example, out of an effort to be hospitable, got rid of my exclusive conviction that Christ is Lord, I would have lost the resource for my hospitality. It would be gone. My home would be gone, right? I would be homeless. Um, and so politically speaking, I would become a bit of a free radical. Um, and I could, I could follow a charismatic leader who could promise to fix everything. I don't know if you can imagine that an, an American leader <laughs> that might do that. <clears throat> but I would just say that young men, young white men in America who are losing their faith are looking for identity and purpose and meaning. And if they're not going to find it in the church, politics is going to try and give it to them. And that's not going to make them hospitable to difference. It's not. It's not. And so um, the, the core areas of danger in, Amer in the United States are, are young white men who are detached from churches and young Muslim men who are detached from mosques. That is where radicalism and extremism spread is when you are detached from institutions. And we've been talking a lot about the importance of institutions here. That the, the best thing for a peaceful and democratic Islam is strong mosque communities, strong Muslim families, strong Muslim schools and institutions whereby, whereby young, young Muslim men can interact with older Muslim men and be mentored and educated and empowered and be given jobs. And so Muslim institutions, their flourishing is really important to the process of pluralism. And when we demonize mosques and we destroy religious freedom and institutions and their integrity of, of Muslim schools and Muslim organizations, um, you pulverize Muslim community. And that is what can really lead to extremism. Because what is dangerous is the young Muslim man who's detached. And uh, they engage in a, an online Islam, which can be a, a recipe for difficulty. That was a rabbit trail. Do we have time for one more? All right. Yes, sir, you back there. Last question. How does that align with ministry? Yes. Qureshi, who it was the same story, who sadly died, you know, a few yes. years ago. These people, both of them, at the universities, became friends or with, with Christian people. And uh, it took about eight years in both cases before these Muslims finally became Christians. Now, in Canada, there's a tr been a tremendous emphasis on multiculturalism. Yes. And you're saying, of course, and I, I agree, that pluralism is the answer. And even Abram Kuyper worked together with the Catholics already, which some people took ill of him. But there was a Muslim professor, way still living, Salim Mansour, who was a political science professor. He's retired now at the university, Western University here in London, Ontario. Now, he wrote a book a few years ago about the delectable lie the delectable lie of multiculturalism. Because he says, I came to this country as a Muslim 40 years ago to become Canadian. And he says, multiculturalism assumes that all cultures are the same. And he says, that is not true. He said, I think that the whole Christian emphasis in the long run does much more for people then he says, the culture of which I am a part, but I remain a Muslim. So it, it is really, you know, I mean, it's really the pluralism then that you're saying, that's the direction we need to go, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And we, you know, we could have a whole nother lecture about multiculturalism. There's a professor, uh, Jonathan Chaplin, who here knows Jonathan Chaplin. Really wonderful political Christian political philosopher who's written amazing things on this topic of multiculturalism. And it's a complex term, and we mean different things when we say that word. 
Um, there's a whole theoretical discussion about multiculturalism. There's a public policy discussion about it. And it can mean a wide variety of things. And I've found his work to be the most helpful. Um, so I'd highly recommend that you um, look into Jonathan Chaplin and his work, um, his work on multiculturalism. He offers uh, a Christian critique, but I would also uh, a Christian retrieval of what the best of multiculturalism has to offer. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for having me. This is uh, truly an honor. <laughs> Matt, I want to uh, invite Dr. Graham now for to close our evening in prayer. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Kamick, for coming our way and for sharing insights from your scholarship. Appreciate it. Thank you to all of you who have come this evening to hear this, and I hope you've got a lot to think about, and uh, appreciate you being here. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, we ask that you will help us as we go from here to ponder on and reflect on what we've heard. We ask also, Lord, that you will help us to see the world through your eyes. Help us to see people as you see them. Help us to truly love our neighbor as ourselves. Let us reflect the love that you have given to us, to others. Go with us now, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.